Today is August the 4th, 2017. My name is Tanya Fincham. I'm with Oklahoma State University, and today I am in Oklahoma City at the Department of Transportation to speak with Brad Murth. And this is part of our Spotlight in Oklahoma project featuring monarch butterflies. So thank you for having me today. And I guess I should say that your, your title is... Uh, State Maintenance Engineer. Okay, there we, there we go. Okay. So thank you for having me. Well, thank you for being here. Let's begin with having you tell us when and where you were born. I was born at Vandenberg Air Force Base on the coast of California, about halfway between LA and San Francisco. And that was way back in 1961. 1961. And your parents, I'm assuming, were they part of the military? Well, my dad was, yes. Part of the military. Yeah. And were they from Oklahoma? Uh, my mother was. Okay. Uh, they met at, at Vance Air Force Base in the 50s. So. Then how did you end up back in, in, uh, in Oklahoma? Oh, uh, parents divorced and moved back here with my mother. I spent my teenage years at El Reno. Okay, and that would have been about when you moved back? Uh, that would have been about 1970. Okay. And where did you graduate high school? At Elrina, yeah. And that would have been 1980? 80, yeah. Okay. And did you have a favorite subject while you were in high school? It was probably science. Science. Were you involved with 4-H or uh, I was in FFA for a couple of years. Okay. Enjoyed that. What kind of projects would you do? Uh, I raised a hog. <laughs> Got my uh, education Aggie con. <laughs> I, uh, I think we got that hog for about 110 bucks and I put about that much feed into him and then uh, uh, sold him for about half that. So. <laughs> well, you didn't have him for dinner then? <laughs> What's that? You didn't have him for dinner No, then. no, we, we sold him at the market. <laughs> Well, do you have brothers and sisters? Yes, I've got uh, an older brother that lives in El Reno, and then a younger brother that uh, served in the Air Force also, and he's currently in Germany uh, flying for FedEx. Okay. And then uh, my father's remarried, and he's got children my age, or his, his uh, wife, my stepmother, has children my age, uh, two sisters and a brother. So. Okay. Pretty good crew when you all get together. Yeah. <laughs> so you finished high school in 1980, and then what did you do? Uh, went out to California for my first year of college in uh, El Camino Junior College there in L.A. or just outside of L.A. And then I came back to Oklahoma State University and spent uh, four years there and got my degree in civil engineering. And you didn't like the coast? Or are there any oh, reason for you coming it. back? I enjoyed it, but there were things I didn't like too. Okay. But, uh, the beach was great and the mountains were great, but uh, going to school you didn't get to spend much time in either one and, <laughs> and I did miss home. So. Sure. Well, what took you out there to begin with? I mean, was My dad was actually still in the Air Force and he uh, had been restationed out there because when I was young he was there. And, uh, like three years old, three to eight, we were there uh, at the uh, Los Angeles Air Force Station, I think. And then uh, he went back uh, when I was older, and he was still in the Air Force at that time. And I went and because the junior colleges in California at that time were uh, free tuition, I was able to go and live with him and, and go to school that first year. And uh, after that, I decided I want to come back and went to Oklahoma State. But she graduated from Oklahoma State in mechanical engineering in 1958. So, right when they changed the name from A and M to uh, That's right, I Oklahoma believe. State. Yeah. yeah. So he had some influence. He was an A and M Tiger, I believe. Is yes, right? it was. Yeah. I think. So he encouraged you to come back to OSU. Uh, he was happy with my choice, but he wasn't uh, crazy about me leaving So, because he'd enjoyed me being out there. Well, then you had to pay tuition. Right, right. Well, after you'd been out there a year, would you be considered it in-state? Well, that was the thing. There was a military waiver. So. Okay, so that didn't make a difference then. Right. So why civil engineering? 
what got you interested in I had uh, started out in electrical engineering, but uh, I was dating a little gal in El Reno that is now my wife, has been ever since, and her dad worked at the Oklahoma Department of Transportation. So okay. I started as a summer engineering intern over there and got introduced to civil engineering. And I always liked being outside. I liked maps. And sometimes we also moonlighted with the local land surveyor. So I learned a little bit about that and I really enjoyed it. Made the transition over to civil. So. I'm not entirely sure what silver, silver engineering is and tells what. Right, well, it's, it's pu picture. public works, roads, highways, buildings, uh, st structures, and uh, environmental, touches on environmental uh, engineering, so. So public transportation. Right. That's so it's inclement weather with, with coming Floods. Away. Um, you know, and the damages they, they inflict on, on our okay. uh, infrastructure. Have any any part to play in where roads go? Uh, me, not in the ma not on the maintenance side. Not on the maintenance no. side, okay. Uh, on the other, the rest of the department of might? Correct, yes. Hmm. Okay. Yeah, there's, the, the decisions are made here uh, in, in this building and also in our field division headquarters we have eight geographic regions and we have a division headquarters in each one of those uh, for the Oklahoma City area and the Stillwater area the division headquarters is in Perry. Okay and you mentioned you were in Duncan so that was another a different district I'm assuming. That's that's true I started here after uh, I got out of college and I was on a one-year training program and then after that, I was permanently assigned. My first permanent assignment was at the Edmond Construction Residency, and we did contract administration there and inspection of the work that our roadway contractors were doing. And after about four years there, I was uh, afforded the opportunity to be the district traffic engineer, division traffic engineer, uh, down at Duncan, and moved down there in 91, and, and was there until uh, two years ago, so. Uh, a few different places in the state. Yes. Yeah. You prefer one over the other? Uh, at the time when we moved down there and all that time that we were raising our children down there, it was a great place uh, to be. Now all our kids are up here. Uh, one of what, the youngest uh, child, our son, is at Oklahoma State University and the two daughters both have homes here in Oklahoma City. And, and we're hopefully at some point be able to make the transition back up here, but uh, Lori still works and our home is still in Duncan, so. So you commute? Yes. Well, actually come up and jump around between the family members up here <laughs> and then go home on weekends, so. Uh, well, Try yeah. not to wear my welcome out at any one place. No. <laughs> well, El Reno's not too far from either one, I guess. From right, my mother's area. still in El Reno, so I'll check on her occasionally too. So, well, we know in the onion burger, right? I think oh, El Reno's yeah. onion burger. Yeah, I've got onions in my veins. <laughs> I grew up on those. They have a really nice Carnegie Library there too. That's true. Yeah, so and can... it's right across the street from one of the onion burger places. <laughs> That's about my extent of El Reno, except it does have a roundhouse too, though, doesn't it? Uh, uh, it has a Where? trolley. Yeah, with yes. a round. Yeah. Right, a street trolley. Um, so at OSU, did you live on campus? Uh, both, on and off. Which I lived in uh, Parker Residence Hall on the third floor. And then after that, after a couple of years there, I moved out with some friends into a rent house. So. And do you have a favorite professor? Oh, gosh. Probably been Dr. Sneathan and uh, the geotechnical side of the dirt side of civil engineering. <laughs> yeah. Or most of those classes in the uh, engineering, engineering south, not in the classroom building, but the engineering right. south. Okay, did you spend much time in the library while you were there. I did, I did. I haven't been in it in decades, but uh, I think you have to have an ID now. I'm not sure, but. Uh, I can remember going, opening those big front doors and hearing the the air howl and 
I used to joke that it was the ghost of professors past that when you were hard when you open that door. But, but yeah, I yeah, I, I spent a lot of time in Edmund Lowe. So. Did you have a favorite spot in there? I don't recall. Yeah. Some people say the fourth floor where the windows are that look over the sure. garden. You don't have to have an ID. You can come in. Okay. <laughs> You could even get a courtesy card and check things out if you wanted to. Uh -huh. book, so, did you, were you uh, active in any of the organizations on campus? I was uh, a member of the election board for a time. Okay. Yeah. And other football games, basketball games. Ah, uh, yes. Try not to miss any of those. Both. I mean, you like both. Both of them. Yeah. Wrestling. Uh, didn't make that. Yeah. yeah. But I can remember one. Gallagher was small and very loud, and then we packed it to the ceiling. So those days, yeah, before they raised the roof. Right, <laughs> right. It'd be nice to get back to that. <laughs> I think we will. We just need a yeah. little bit more time. Yeah. yeah. Uh, well, did you have a favorite spot on campus? Oh. Um, the Student Union is a really neat place, you know. At, at that time, it wasn't as neat as it is now, but it was still still a neat place. Uh, the grounds are are uh, kept up so much better than they were when I was in school. It's it's just a really neat experience to go back there. Well, in the eighties, mm, was the was the bowling alley still in the Union? Yes. Was it? Yes. I don't know when they took it out, but my wife Lori took bowling. <laughs> Well, her classes. Cool. So she she's a graduate of OSU. Yes. Too? What what year did she graduate? In eighty. Or I'm sorry, in eighty five. Yeah. Same as you. you yours yeah. would have been eighty five right. too, since you went one year and came back yeah. and did. Okay. Do you remember graduation day? I do. Yeah, a little bit. <laughs> I remember hers too. <laughs> Was it in the arena or the uh, football stadium? Outside. No, inside? no, no. Inside. No, no. I, I graduated in December and she graduated in May, so part of hers was outside. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Mine was indoors and I can't remember where it was. Well, I mean, big enough had to be the arena, I guess. Right. It's the biggest building on campus inside. There weren't many in the civil engineering department. It seemed like we had about a dozen people graduate in December, so. Was there a class that just about got your goat? Plenty of them. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> uh, thermodynamics would be one. <laughs> yeah. All right, fair enough. <laughs> okay, so we're going to fast forward. You moved from Duncan, and now I'm not, not from Duncan. You moved to Duncan, and then two years ago you came here. In a typical day, what do you do now? Oh gosh, there's. Uh, a number of things um, over our our operation side of maintenance. Um, I'm the state maintenance engineer, but I have no maintenance employees working for me other than uh, a few mechanics down in our central garage. But we manage the uh, maintenance management system, which is a, a, a software platform that that all of our field units report their daily work activities to. We track their fleet. Uh, and equipment in that uh, all their uh, materials transactions and their time their, their work time what activities they're uh, doing on a daily basis is all entered uh, at those field maintenance units and then that is all tracked in the maintenance management system so we deal with that a lot uh, have the beautification branch here which uh, is, we do a number of things with that. One is uh, we assist in planting wildflowers on the state highway system. And then we work with Keep Oklahoma Beautiful and uh, assist them in, in their efforts to uh, do a lot of volunteer uh, projects around the state, uh, cleaning up and uh, picking up litter on highways. And, uh, they've got a website, you can see a number of things that they do. The Adopt a Highway. Adopt a Highway is part of it. That's uh, one of the programs that uh, we manage here at ODOT. Uh, 
and then we recently entered into a contract with another company that provides litter cleanup and it's kind of a pilot project to see how it works out. They go out and find a sponsor uh, that will actually pay to have the roads cleaned up and we adopt or they adopt out um, a one mile stretch of highway and in return that sponsor, whether it be a company or an organization, gets to put their name on a sign. And uh, so that's something we'll be looking for probably looking to do more of in the future. And then we've got another side of the maintenance division house is the intelligent transportation uh, system. And if you've seen the big signs up over the highway that change messages, they have travel times. That's a big part of uh, that group down there. We are providing um, fiber optics on our highway rights away for public agencies to utilize for data transfer mm. and we also use that for our own uh, communications and data transfer and then there are a number of uh, cameras up uh, especially in the urban areas not all of them are in the urban areas of Tulsa and Oklahoma City but they look at and show what's going on out on the state highway system That's and better behave. <laughs> uh, well, if there's a, an accident, sure. we can we can monitor that. We can just see how the traffic's flowing, and uh, sometimes it's a verification thing because we have other data sources. Uh, mm -hmm. Most people that have a cell phone, uh, that cell phone location, if not the number, at least the location is actually being recorded, and then that data is called third party data and we obtain it and we can put uh, we can display it on a map in a format that is uh, would tell a driver that uh, traffic's moving slowly here mm. if you've ever been on google maps and seen the red lines where the traffic uh, congestion is that's from that, that third party data so so you need to be a computer jockey yeah. Huh? Yeah. wow I notice I notice the signs, especially when they say silver alert or right. like that. or if it's a funny, sometimes they'll have a catchy phrase up there. Yeah, on Wednesdays we do the works on Wednesdays and that's uh, designed to get people to think about highway safety and at the same time uh, bring in a little levity to the situation. The, uh, the travel times are something we do during the morning and evening rush hours. And then the silver, silver alerts, we work with uh, the Department of Public Safety on those. So, and then, like, if, uh, well, you, oh, when you're fixing road repair, that sort of thing's under you, you as well, fixing potholes and right. modern bridges if they've been. Well, the, the uh, employees that are actually performing that work, they report to our field division offices. Okay. So, well, that filters up to you. Right, right. Well, I, I, I develop uh, operational policy okay. and I provide support to the field. Uh, again, that uh, software platform, the maintenance management system, and uh, we track the fleet in there and keep, you know, we, we assist the field divisions as our primary uh, goal here in the maintenance division. Are you having to do anything special with all these quakes that we've been having? The field divisions uh, have an inspection, a bridge inspection protocol. Dependent, it's dependent on how strong the quake was. Uh, so if it's of a certain level and uh, they will go out a certain many miles radius and inspect all the bridges within that radius on, a, on the state highway system. And if we're asked, we can assist counties. So. That's a, a protocol that's been developed and refined over the past four or five years. And we're also about to implement a software called the ShakeCast that will analyze the earthquake and help us prioritize which bridges should be inspected first. I just wanted with the one, the recent one with uh, Edmund that was 4.2. Right. They, Went out and inspected all the bridges within the radius that's okay. defined for that 
uh, that magnitude of quakes. So it's never a dull moment. No, <laughs> no especially in the winter. You know, All you have to do, I yeah. think, there. Yeah. You know, four or five inches of snow and roads are closed. Right. So sand trucks then, or right. whatever, whatever you right. put down nowadays. Right. It used to be soft, but it's and not. And we work with the uh, State Emergency Operations Center. A different group, okay. Yeah. We have fingers a little bit and connect it all together, I guess. Mm -hmm. And your your education at OSU helped to prepare you for all of this? As much as possible. <laughs> it well, it was, uh, you know, most of, of uh, a bachelor's in civil engineering is, is uh, theory. Uh, a lot of, of the the actual practice is dealing with people, you know, in the in the in the field. So that's something you get by life experience. So. Well, I mean, computers came along after. Right. We. I mean, the early nineties, wasn't it, when the computers came? We on had uh, desktop uh, PCs at Oklahoma State uh, a year or two before I graduated. Okay. We certainly didn't have the internet. <laughs> you know, we, yeah, I guess that's what I should say instead of computers. You're I think right. it was 1995 when we first got hooked up to the internet at the field division in Duncan. So well, and that would I would think that helped a lot. It did. It did not at first. It was the the email was the first big big benefit to us. Can find out things quicker. Yes. We find uh, Google Earth to be a big benefit because it saves a lot of trips to the field. You know, we can we can sit in a conference room and and uh, look at Google Earth and look right at the road we're discussing and and uh, we've got our own GIS capabilities now, which we're expanding. So that's it wasn't that many years ago that we were doing. A lot of our, uh, a lot of things on paper that we're now doing on the computers. So. Well, with Google Earth, you just have to be worried about it, how current it was. I guess. Yes, you yes, have to take that into consideration. Mm -hmm. But the technology, that aspect of it, they wasn't part of your classes at OSU then. I did have a computer aided uh, design class. Okay, well then that, that laid the foundation, I guess. And, and your wife's degree was in what? Business is and personal it? management. I think now they would call it HR. Yeah. yeah. And she was from? El Reno. El Reno. You know as well, okay. Yeah, she was born and raised there. And your mother was from here. Was it her parents? Yes. Originally from here or did they yes. move? Did they come, grandparents come through the land run or anything? Uh, Years? they came uh, through, the family came, on her side, came from the southeastern part of the U.S., Tennessee, uh, Alabama, northern Mississippi, and came up through north Texas into the Ada area. Okay. Is there, Oklahoma's in your blood. Oh, yeah. <laughs> your roots, root, roots are here. Well, have you been back to get a master's or anything like that? No. no. Haven't needed one, necessarily. I don't know. Well, I could have used one, but I haven't needed one. <laughs> Not enough to go get one. Huh? <laughs> right. And you said you have two children? Three. 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 Yeah. And they're all OSU? Oh, no, no. I have one that went to that other school. <laughs> That's okay. That's okay. Uh, yeah. Two out of three is not bad. I tease her. We tease her, but we're very proud of her. Sure. Uh, the oldest went to UCO. Oh. Katie went to UCO. Allison went to OU and, and got her degree in, in uh, nuclear medicine technology. And uh, John's currently in nutrition at Oklahoma State. He may go into nursing. So. Well, he'll have to, no. Yeah, he'll have to transfer. Right. Right. They they started something new that you have to have your associate degree in nursing before you do that. Well, I mean, OU, what, what your daughter got at OU, OSU doesn't have, so 
Right. That's okay then. Oh yeah. <laughs> That's okay. All in Oklahoma, so it's a it's a good thing. So, what where with these different things you were talking about beautification and all that? Where does the monarchs fit into any of those? Which? Well, I can I can uh, the one of the big assistance things we can do for the monarch is try to preserve our uh, nectar sources and the milkweed. So mowing is a big part of, of that effort or lack of effort if you want to call it that way because what it's resulted in is us reducing our, our mowing, uh, number of mowing cycles. Well, that's an additional reason that we've uh, re reduced our, our mowing cycles. Uh, the need to shift a lot of our effort uh, towards pavement preservation and bridge projects is another another uh, factor involved there. So uh, in, I think the department perhaps became first, first became aware of this in early 2015. Uh, Dr. Martin up at, at Oklahoma State and Turfgrass Research Center proposed a, a research uh, project uh, to look at milkweed and, and how the butterfly and mowing all tied together. And uh, that's the result of the uh, research plots that you see out on State Highway 51. So while I was still in the field at Duncan, we we got an email from uh, the director of operations informing us that it was possibly a concern uh, and shortly after that I came up here uh, as state maintenance engineer and in the fall of that year the director got asked to attend a summit in, uh, in Washington DC at the uh, in the White House office complex and he couldn't attend so I don't remember if I may have made some comments in support of mowing less or, or what it was but I got tagged to go to that and uh, mowing and maintenance all tied together and, and that's part of the uh, the pro preservation effort so I got to attend that uh, summit in December of 2015. Is that when the quarter estates got together and signed that uh, the memorandum? I-35 Monarch Highway uh, Memorandum of Understanding was signed uh, that spring okay. of 2016. Of 16. Yes, between the six states that uh, I-35 passes through. So we're a year into it. No. Yes, yes. And as part of that, what did you do? Well, what after the did? after the uh, summit, or as part of the summit, we met with scientists from all over the nation. Uh, the other six, other five states were there. Federal Highway Administration was there, and we talked, learned about uh, the monarch uh, biology a little bit, and and about what might help it and how we might work together as states to uh, help the monarch situation. And came back from that and talked or presented what I'd learned to uh, the chief engineer and director of operations. It wasn't uh, too long after that the termination was made to cut back on, on our uh, spring mowing cycle. And then at the same time, uh, the state of Minnesota was kind of leading the charge to develop the memorandum of understanding. And it was signed at the American Association of State Highway Transportation Officials annual meeting. Uh, I believe it was in Iowa. So that was in the spring of 2016. So the, uh, how, just out of curiosity, you, you mentioned cycling, mowing cycles. How many times would you mow during a year, like a 12 month period? You well, know, there was an attempt in the rural areas um, to try to get 
it mowed about four times. I think we typically, on average, probably mowed three times, three and a half, perhaps, and that's uh, everything that we could mow. Uh, now we've we've cut that back essentially to two times. Now we may be out there mowing in what we call the safety zone uh, more frequently, and that's the first 15 to 30 feet okay. from the edge of the pavement. Uh, that's uh, you know that's something that we have to do for safety. We have to uh, preserve those sight lines so people can see around corners, and and also it helps with fire suppression. And you know that's that's just one of those things that we've got to continue. So is that a federal regulation that it has to be fifteen feet or whatever? No, no, uh, I don't know that there's federal mandate on us to mow that but it's just good practice sure. so, so um, beyond that though beyond that 15 feet then you can choose yes whether yeah. to do it or not we typically in mo on most routes will mow 30 feet okay. and that's that's well, that's about two uh, batwing mower widths so it works out well on most of our areas and that and then later in the year now in july we're mowing uh, beyond that out to the fence if, if it's not forested area so. i'll have to pay attention on my way back right, <laughs> right. well with the monarchs you're planning maybe half that uh at least in some spots that's about right you know and we're holding off that full width mowing uh until july and what that does uh as i understand from the scientists is that allows the monarch to lay eggs on the milkweed that are present and then for that egg to develop uh, fully develop into a butterfly and then once that occurs most of them go on north that first generation goes on north into Iowa and Minnesota, what they call the core area, and there's three or four more generations born. So during the middle of the summer in Oklahoma, there are very few monarchs here. And then in August, around the middle of August, they start coming back in Oklahoma. So you try not to move then? Uh, right. Okay. And you typically what, just mow from April to October or something? Right. Right. Typically, uh, we would start mowing maybe in uh, as late as early May or early April and then into May, uh, first mowing, but now uh, we're doing a lot less of that. So, so it would think it'd be a money saver as well, mowing less. It is. Uh, certainly, savings on, on the fuel it takes to mow. Uh, savings on our equipment. Those uh, employees that would do that mowing are still at work though. They're just spending that time doing something else. So, And with the needs we have on the pavements and bridges, uh, it's time well spent. Well, do the like citizens complain about it not being mowed? Yes. Uh, we have, you know, there's still a number of, of uh, the society would rather see it mowed, uh, but there's kind of a growing number of people that appreciate what you'd call prairie grass areas, perhaps native grass areas, and uh, we hear from them more and more too. So there's a lot of concerns, not just on the monarch, but for the honeybees, and that uh, April through July 1st time period is is the prime time for the wildflowers. So those nectar sources for the other pollinators are one of the concerns and one of the benefits to delaying that mowing. Well, as part of that, are you planting more? No. Just no. whatever's out we, there. We haven't uh, haven't modified any any changes there yet. So, actually, in the past several years, our our uh, Wildflower planting, the specific wildflower planting, has kind of um, uh, cut back because we had so many years of drought. Yeah. 
right now we're not getting as many uh, volunteer groups come in with money or seed to do that type of planning. We haven't funded, ODOT hasn't funded uh, that many wildfire plantings, but what we do is when the, a, a group gets money together and purchases seed, we work with them to find a site and we actually do the planting for them. Okay, and then, they, and then you maintain it? Yes. Yes. I wondered about the people complaining. I guess the fire, I haven't thought about that. That was an issue in Oklahoma always, I guess. Right. It's the, not uh, down. Our back slopes, as I said, there are some areas that have some really pretty native grass areas, what you might call prairie, but uh, a high percentage of it is, is invasive species like uh, Johnson grass, which gets three or four feet high and, and looks unruly and it's unsightly. And, it can be a real fire hazard too. So, well, you do the medians as well. It's not just the sides; it's the median. That's right. And in most places, we'll do the entire median. There are some areas where the median is very wide, and we can do that safety cut on the, either side of it and leave an area in the middle. But for the most part, we mow mow the median from pavement to pavement. So, and then you planted the garden out front here. And then the garden at the Welcome Center? That's right. We have a, have a uh, what they call a way station, a monarch way station. And it's got milkweed, different species of milkweed in it, and some nectar plants, and a few, uh, few plants of native grasses. Uh, that's up at the I 35 Tourism Welcome Center at uh, 122nd Street in northeast Oklahoma City. We did that last spring and it did very well last year and it started out very well this year but the drought has really hit it hard along with some insect damage, uh, different type of cal caterpillar. So uh, I'm concerned that there won't be any milkweed left when the monarchs come back here in a few weeks but it it may re-sprout, we'll see. Where would you get your plants to plant to do that? Uh, we got those from some local nurseries. And we also worked uh, with an organization called Monarch Watch, which is led by a professor at KU, uh, Chip, and he he uh, started Monarch Watch about 20 years ago and has been tracking the situation with the monarchs for a long, long time. And he's working with uh, a number of Indian tribes here in Oklahoma to start growing milkweeds and some, some private nurseries. So we purchased some of those plants from Monarch Watch uh, through one of the nurseries here in Oklahoma down at Ada. And they come back every year, you don't have to, right? theoretically, yeah. you don't have to replant. Correct. And then uh, we also worked with another nursery in the, in the Norman area, purchased plants. So how often do you have to go out and do anything with the with it? Uh, we have kind of a volunteer uh, weed pulling, we're pulling weeds out of the weeds uh, <laughs> out here. Twice so far this year, we've come in early on Friday and pulled weeds, and then we let the volunteers go home a little early. And uh, haven't had to do that up at the Welcome Center because it's been so dry. Uh, but I've often will stop by there in the evening and do a little work and because of my situation staying with family up here it's it's handy so i like gardening uh at home we've got a vegetable garden <laughs> but i enjoy it so well have you noticed any butterflies visiting doesn't necessarily my oh last butterflies. fall we had a number of we had a lot of visitation yeah so, and we had uh, caterpillars on the milkweed so. It, it, it uh, was successful. So. Well, have you done any extra research to learn anything more about them, or are you just basing it on what you've been told? Uh, I've kept track on the Facebook pages and things okay. like that and learned quite a bit. Yeah. It's kind of, you mentioned earlier my Springer Spaniels, and I got into the uh, field trial on Springer Spaniels in the early 90s back in, in the went to the field trials in southern Kansas 
and the the fields that we ran in were full of native grasses so I started learning some of the species and learned to appreciate so while I was maintenance engineer in the Duncan area uh, I came to to uh, appreciate those native grass areas and tried to encourage some of the superintendents not to mow them and so when the butterfly issue came up it kind of fit in well with that and I embraced it and uh, here I am the butterfly man for the Department of Transportation. <laughs> <laughs> but you... but uh, I like the way native grasses look and uh, game birds or you know they they benefit from that so that was one of my motivations lesser lesser prairie chicken and the quails yeah we, we don't have prairie chicken around this area but a uh, lot of quail so. do you do you recall in your youth do you recall any monarch i just it's knew they were there yeah and, yeah i remember it from the science lesson in class or anything I remember my kids uh, raising monarchs in grade school. Wow. So. And that would have been in Duncan? Yes. Yeah. Back in uh, 1989, the department entered into an agreement with the Oklahoma Wildlife uh, Conservation Commission and the agreement was to defer summer mowing until august 1st on those areas outside the safety zone and i don't know how long or what impact that actually had but uh, all through the 90s uh, mowing was was encouraged uh, it was keeping a nice clean mowed right of way was a, a, a target that we are encouraged to pursue and so the agreement kind of fell by the wayside interestingly in the early 1990s there was also another effort similar to the monarch highway which was called the prairie passage and the prairie passage was just that it was an effort to preserve uh, prairie areas on, on i-35 and other nearby roadways on the on their right away so it didn't work or uh we did work? we planted a, there were actually funds that came to the departments uh, to do plantings and we planted a lot of acres of wildflowers with that money and they still there uh some of the wildflower plots are still there uh, some years there'll be a lot of wildflowers in them and others so long it just depends on the environmental conditions and weather basically and when we mow it oh, and then when you mow is it but you have to it's a guessing game just about with the monarchs too i mean when are they going to come through and need it or weather events right well all it, that you probably learned from dr Baum that they winter in mexico mm -hmm. and they always come through in april uh, they leave down there in, in late march and i guess they're laying eggs on milkweed in southern texas and they get up here uh, in April so they come here and this year they actually uh, the theory is they got held up by north winds and they so they were here and they were laying a lot of eggs here uh, it was hard to find a milkweed plant without an egg on it and uh, then, they, then they went on north as soon as they could and that first generation was born here and, and they went north too so they have what they found that they start coming back in in the middle of August and right now there's been a number of sightings in the Tulsa area oh, okay. in fact they've seen quite a few in Tulsa uh, all summer long but uh, the, the number of sightings is starting to pick up early yeah I think so earlier than last year so you wouldn't want to mow right now then you wouldn't want to mow in, in. Well, we've got to because uh, we're behind. <laughs> but uh, it's still that time of year when it's going to be hot. So uh, I suppose the the breeding activity will be to a minimum for a little while longer. 
Yeah. Well, I mean, if it's not, it's been dry, yeah. so things that aren't growing. Right. We've got so many, you know, the Johnson grass isn't habitat, so it, it needs to be mowed. It doesn't help the, the monarch, or it's not habitat for birds really either, so, or the ground nesting birds, because it's too tall and thick. But, uh, we need to get caught up on that, and then perhaps uh, hold back until the fall mowing. And normally we'll mow uh, after October, late October, and then, you know, after the first frost, so. And they're already on their way by then. Yeah. yeah. Hopefully they're long gone. Get, to get ready for the winter. Right. You see a lot of, uh, well, I have seen a lot of yellow ones, so I'm not sure what they are. I'm going to have to go do a little bit of research, too, and, and native plants. I know part of the grant for that Chip Taylor is doing is collecting collecting native plants and trying to do some of that nectar the nectar plant right. too. So maybe eventually they'll have seeds for you to plant wherever. On, on we we do some native planting. I think most of it has been up in the Panhandle area, where in that division we have up there, where the prairie chicken was more of a concern. So. Right now, there are the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service is exploring the, uh, whether or not the monarch needs to be listed as an endangered species. And that's one of the big uh, highway business uh, issues that the, preserving the monarch would be a benefit to the highway, just our highway business, because if it's listed uh, as threatened or endangered, it will impact all of our highway projects because if we're impacting habitat when we widen the highway, uh, we may have to mitigate that damage to the habitat by uh, providing more habitat somewhere else or or proving that we have habitat here that we're preserving. It, you know, it, it could be uh, an additional uh, cost or burden to our business process. So. So it'd be to your Beyond day. just good stewardship, uh, we have an interest in in keeping the monarch population up. So. Well, any motivations, right? A good thing, I guess, too. Hmm. I hadn't thought of that aspect of it. it does come down to economics. Yes. Yeah, see, anytime too. you know we have a highway project, uh, we have to uh, do quite a bit of environmental. Uh, investigation at least to determine whether or not we're going to be impacting either migratory birds or or uh, endangered species. Uh, it's Oklahoma, I don't know if what Oklahoma has that are endangered, do you? Uh, the bald eagle is one of them, uh, yeah. but it's also migratory. I'm not sure which one that one's. It's not endangered anymore. Uh, we have bats that are an issue. Mm. We've got a oh. beetle, the American bearing beetle is is endangered or threatened. Oh uh, gosh, there's a, some minnows, Arkansas river shiner, I believe it is. A fish, uh, how would, that wouldn't necessarily impact what you do, but I guess... Well, anytime the, we do bridge work. Oh, yeah, yeah, that's true. And that's where the bats anytime are Anytime we do be. bridge work on one of the streams that it's known to habitate, mm. so... And bats would probably be bridge related to? Uh, that would be, in, well, That that's a possibility, but uh, anytime we're impacting the forest canopy that they might uh, nest in. So we have to look and see if we're going to impact it, and then if we are, we got to deal with, with those issues. Yeah, how to minimize and... Right. Mm, burying beetle. Yes. <laughs> the American burying beetle. And, that and would then be we have migratory birds issues, the cliff and barn swallows that uh, put the mud nests on our bridges. Uh, if we're doing work on that bridge in the summer, we we usually have to hold off until they're go gone. On you know they've migrated south for the winter. So and then do, they, do they do you take the nest the mud down? Yes, and then they they rebuild them the next year. Mm -hmm. But if we can move in early, we can net a bridge to keep them off so that they go find another bridge to nest on. 
has, has difficulties involved with it. So. Uh, several of those on the turnpike between Stillwater and Tulsa, I noticed that, but they didn't know what kind of bird it was. Yeah, it's uh, either a barn or a cliff swan. And they're on the endangered list? No, they're a migratory bird. Oh, migratory. And it's interesting because before we, you know, we started building all these structures, uh, all they had was cliffs and, you know, and some trees, but they don't, you don't see them utilizing trees that much, so we probably increase their, my guess as an engineer, <laughs> would be we would increase their population 10,000 fold because we've got, we built so much habitat for them. Yeah, and we have, because of the, the uh, Migratory Bird Act, we have to protect them. So. Hmm. Uh, yeah, so you, you're watching all kinds of regulations then. Right. Oh, right. Too much to think about. <laughs> anyway. So I think the uh, determination on the Monarch, I believe they have to make a decision by the middle of next year. It might be 2019, I can't remember. But uh, some of the other interviews you had, they might have discussed that. Yeah, that's it. So how are you assessing if what you're doing is helping or, or not? Or do you have anything in place for we're that? Just, we're not really uh, assessing that. I am tracking uh, how much reduction in mowing we've done compared to the four years prior to cutting back. And uh, last year, by this time, we had saved uh, or it had mowed about 70,000 acres less than the four previous years at this time. So that's a lot of potential habitat out there. How much do you know, before that, how much were you mowing if 70s? Oh gosh. Twice that or three times that? I'd have to look it up. Yeah. Well, but a lot more. No, no. Oh yeah, it was more. It was more. It was, we had already done what we call a full width typically. And uh, probably normally we would have done, I think, around 160,000 acres. And now we've cut it back to 90. Well, that's by mid July. That 70 should help then. Right. Help something anyway. <laughs> right. Well, what's the best, what's your favorite part of your job? What do you do? Oh, do you have a favorite part? Dealing with. All the different people. <laughs> Being inside or outside? Uh, both. I'm enjoying both. When it's 100 degrees outside, I enjoy being in here. <laughs> well, on snow days, when they're calling in people to come scrape or do whatever, do you have to, to jump in and help if there's a shortage? Well, we're, we uh, typically are, are helping or have a presence at least over at the Emergency Operations Center, and if directed we're, traffic, we're, yes. well, we're coordinating uh, assistance if generators are needed somewhere during an ice storm mm -hmm. and that sort of thing, and, and answering questions from the public uh, if if they've got a question about how a route's being treated uh, in a certain area, we'll try to get them in touch with the people that are responsible for that area. So. And the, the ITS devices that we have, the changeable message signs, uh, we make sure those are up and running. But another big thing we do is we provide the, the map uh, of our roadway conditions. So snow and ice conditions that you can see online at, on our website is one of the big things we also do. So. Do you pay attention to like the use the mesonet for weather? We, we look at that data. Uh, we're also, uh, we have a project coming up that may be, may be led in September uh, to install what we call road weather information systems and there'll be a, a station every 30 miles on I-35 from Texas to Kansas and that'll give us data on the pavement surface, surf weather and the pavement uh, temperatures subsurface temperatures, bridge deck temperatures. So we'll be able to look and without driving out there and actually see what's going on on the pavement at those locations. 
We have a network to kind of send right. back to you. Similar look. concept to the Mesa network. Right. Their sites around. Right. Well, always something. There'll new. actually be a camera too. So at any one of those locations, we could pull up the camera and say, "Yeah, it's snow. On, there's snow on that pavement." <laughs> and if there's a motorist stranded, you can do call, call for help or something. Right. Send, right. send someone up. You know, in, in each county, we have uh, a number of trucks and and drivers, and then there's the superintendent, someone in charge at all times. But they can't be even so; they can't be everywhere all the time. So, uh, more information helps helps with our reaction time. The cameras are everywhere. Yes, more and more. More and more. I can see the good and the bad for that, but... Uh. Most of our cameras are uh, very high, and you can see a vehicle, but beyond that detail, you can't zoom in and look at <laughs> license plates or anything like that. So. It's come a long way in, since you started here. Oh, yeah. 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 When I started here, we were still drafting by hand with ink pens. Oh, now it's all computerized. I was trying to do my math. How many years has it been? 30? It'll be 32 in January. 32. So, how many more do you have to do before you can retire? I'm eligible right now. Oh. Is it rule of 80 or whatever? Yeah. But I'm enjoying this work. So. Sure. And since you like mo monarchs, stay around a little longer. <laughs> well, well, I've always enjoyed a wide range of scientific stuff and I enjoy the outdoors and uh, what protects the monarch is also something that protects game birds and, and native grasses and promotes perhaps us mowing a little less, puts our people on those back slopes a little less. So Back slopes, that's... The steep slope behind the ditch that you often oh, see. Yeah. yeah. You know, watch, they look scary sometimes the way they slope mm -hmm. so much at their... <laughs> right. And then they have to dodge the poles. Right. <laughs> yeah, our uh, mowing that safety zone is is uh, typically, in most cases, it's the flattest area, but it's also where we have to go around more signs. So it can be, it can be the most expensive mowing. And you have to pick up a litter before you mow? Right. And sometimes after, depending on how tall, you know, sometimes you have to do both. So. I wanted the process for that. And then look, look, just someone who doesn't know, it looks like you mow like two yards, I mean, two miles and turn around and mow those same two miles back or however many miles in it. Yeah. So you want to. S I think every crew does attack that a little bit differently, yeah. but typically they'll do a two mile stretch. So. They want it, you want to end up before you started? We just don't want our mowers stretched out over too many miles. Yeah, I wonder to me, you got to get your machine from one yeah. to the next. So, right. logically, so typically you do concentrate on the two mile stretch and then move the next day or whenever <laughs> move their signs and concentrate on the next section. It's the logistics that's interesting. Right. And oftentimes we'll be out there mowing and they may get called away to assist with traffic control in an accident or or a, a detour, you know, because the road's closed. Or, uh, they may get a report that there's a stop sign down and they have to stop at least two guys and, and go fix the stop sign. So there's all kinds of things our maintenance crews uh, get involved in. And they get stolen a lot too, don't they? They Stop. get what? Stolen a lot, don't they? Stop signs. Uh, yes, we have a lot of signs stolen. It's not just the stop. Right. And they're expensive. Well, there's a price to that too. To certainly, it. certainly, there's a cost. We, uh, you know, we try to do some things on our signposts to make it a little harder, at least, and strip the. The bolts off and stuff, so it's a little harder to get off of there. But if someone's determined, they can. There, there are people who have knocked them down on purpose with an old beat up truck just so it's easier to run off with the materials, you know. Uh, 
it's it's a challenge. What what's the most unusual thing that you've had you witnessed or in this position? Uh, There's got to be well, something, something that's just just before coming here. Uh, when I was in the field, we had the rock slide on I-35 down in the Arbuckles, mm -hmm. and I guess that was one of the most unusual, and the flooding that went on with it, and the damage to, to, to the highways, um, that was one of the most unusual things, that rock slide down there near Turner Falls area. Well, when you travel outside of Oklahoma on, on highways, are you spot checking, saying, oh, Constantly, yeah. <laughs> we do that better yeah. than they do, or they do that better than us, or? I do, I, uh, as I said, I was down there in that Division 7 out of our Duncan headquarters for 25 years, and uh, when we're discussing something here, I often have to take myself back to get my head back in that mode and think about it in terms of a roadway in Division 7, and, uh, I often, when I'm traveling the state, I, I see how other people are doing things. It's, you don't drive down the road anymore just looking at the countryside because you're also looking at the pavement and the signs and everything else. Uh, some of them I've interviewed say they're looking for milkweed now. <laughs> uh, I do, I do that too, now that I'm aware of it. I haven't been able to spot any. I'm not sure I'm looking for the right thing. I've got to, I haven't seen an actual. Well, we can go down here to the, the garden here a little bit, and I can show you what to look for because okay. there's uh, we have a lot in Oklahoma. Uh, there are people that think we need to be planning more, but I think our time and efforts best spent preserving what we have at the right time of the year. And maybe the nectar are, plants seem to be more important. Yeah, we have a lot of milkweed on our roadsides in Oklahoma, and it's very resilient because uh, last year, the first year that we cut back on mowing, there was a lot of mature milkweed there that had come from the years when we were doing a lot of mowing. So it's, uh, it's a very resilient plant with a big root system. And it's hard to knock it out if you were trying to on purpose. Well, how does it do with fire? I mean, does- I, I think it does just fine. It's a prairie, uh, you know, it evolved in a prairie ecosystem and, and the prairie benefits from fire, so I suppose you could burn it too often, but it, uh, most of your prairie plants respond well to fire. Yeah, I wonder with the grass, you can see that it would catch faster. I don't, yeah. know, I don't know if it would do. I think it probably just shrivels it up and it eventually catch fire, but it doesn't okay. burn as fast. Oh, that makes sense. Yeah. They said it's kind of like the milk part of it's like a latex. Yeah, and it's got a waxy, most of them have a waxy leaf. So. I'll have to see one up close and personal then. Okay. <laughs> I usually watch for prairie hawks when I'm driving. Yeah. yeah. I yeah. guess they're called prairie hawks, big birds sitting on the fences. Yeah. <laughs> Red tail Red hawks. Tails. Red tails. The yeah, one time between Stillwater and Enid. I uh, spotted 20, counted 20. Oh, that was a lot, but maybe not for that length of that distance. Uh, one flew into this window once, not too long ago. I was looking at my computer and I heard something hit the window. Oh, my gosh, what was that? So I stood up and looked. And, well, as I looked at the ground, one got off the ground and flew off that way, just a few feet off the ground. I thought, wow, <laughs> <laughs> I think he saw his own reflection in the window and flew into it. <laughs> They're amazing creatures too. Yeah. I well, I mean, we're learning a lot with all of it, with this project too, with the environmental, like you said. You got your science aspect and transportation aspects. Right. And schools, just a little bit of everything. And part of what you're doing, it, it, from what I've found, it's, it's nationwide or good part of the nation's working on it too so and then there's, there's a, a you know the population here is what they call the eastern monarch population and they migrate to mexico down close to mexico city but there's a population on the west coast that stays on the other side of the rocky mountains and they winter on the california coastline so there's research being done over there too so. i wonder are there numbers 
decline into I it? I believe so, for the same reasons, habitat loss. And then there's a population in South Florida that stays there all year. And they don't know how these populations interact. So. Yeah. Give them, give them time. They'll figure it out. I would know. As an engineer, I know way more about the monarch than I, <laughs> than I thought I would know. I'm, I'm impressed, <laughs> yes. <laughs> but it's it's interesting. You go uh, home and say, Lauren, guess what I learned today? Oh, yeah. <laughs> and, uh, my daughter, the biology major, has raised some monarchs in her, in her, in her, at her house and, and released them. So. I didn't realize how easy, really, that e is, is to do. Yeah, it's as long as you've got them food. As long as you've got the milkweed and it's a piece of cake. Yeah, she's had a good time with it. Yeah, that's she's got some friends with children that she will often bring over and let them release them. Some fun stuff. Get them interested yeah. in and science. Now we've covered what I intended to cover. Is there anything you want to add? Oh, uh. Just be patient with us when you see our roads unmowed, or, or 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 when we have mowed. Understand that we've got limitations and, and other priorities along with with the preservation of habitat. So. Uh, after all of this, I'm okay if you don't mow. <laughs> and I, I, the litter litter part, you know, is a different story altogether. But keeping our land grand just takes a team to do it, right. doesn't it? And then climate change has got to play into all this somewhere. That's a, that's an intro, That's a whole different discussion. Climate it, change. It is. Yeah. Yes, I agree. For another day. Well, nothing else. My last question is: How do you want to be remembered when history is written about you? What do you want it to say about you? Uh, as, as a good uh, steward of our state highway system. And go pokes. Yeah. There you go. <laughs> Absolutely. All right. Thank you very much. All right. Well, thank you.